Hey everyone, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmidt, and today we are talking about the problem of evil with two very special philosophers, Dr. Luis Oliveira and Dr. Justin Mooney. Now, before we get into the discussion, let's just briefly get a glimpse into who you guys are and what you do. So let's start with Justin. Who are you and what do you do? Hi, um, well, I'm Justin. Uh, so I am a, a assistant professor of philosophy at Holy Cross College in Massachusetts. I just started there. Um, and I'm really happy that I landed this job because uh, I've been on the job market for the last few years, but this is a more permanent position. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm a philosopher. I think a lot about material objects and also a lot about God. And so obviously today's discussion is kind of more on the God side of things. I'm Luis Oliveira. I am an associate professor at the University of Houston. I, I work in epistemology, mostly thinking about normativity in that space. And I work in philosophy religion, mostly thinking about the problem of evil. I've written papers on both those topics and uh, I, I'm happy to be here to talk about this. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. And so for the audience, I've put links to Justin's stuff and Luis's stuff in the description. You can find uh, their fill people profiles and things like that. So you can read all their lovely papers. But today we're focusing on one paper in particular that Luis wrote in the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion. It is called God and Gratuitous Evil Between the Rock and the Hard Place. That paper is linked in the description if you guys want to read it. So let's just turn it over to Luis to basically just give us a kind of bird's eye overview of, of what's kind of going on in this paper and maybe set up any, any background about uh, gratuitous evil, what that is, what the problem is, and yeah. This paper um, has a storied background. It took me a long time to get this paper completed in this form and get it published. Uh, it started with thinking a little bit more carefully about what it would take for something to justify God in permitting some evil. I think a lot of the conversation on the problem of evil turns on mentioning intuitive things that could be God's justification for evil, maybe free will, maybe the way in which some goods are connected to, to the evils that God permits. Um, and I've, I felt for a while, a little bit of a dissatisfaction with the um, the degree to which those suggestions were being probed in their details. What would it take for some of these things really to count as justifying God? And the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me that wait a second, if we once we sort of get cleared eyed on how those things could play the role of justifying God and permitting evil, it turns out that there's other consequences to that. And, when I was first thinking about this, I was thinking of the kind of claim that we see uh, from John Hick, for example, that there are some goods that are necessarily connected to some evils. So God had to permit these evils in order to get these goods. And I thought, wait a second, if that's the case, then it seems like if that's doing the justifying, then it seems like anyone could permit the evil and get the good and it they would be justified in doing that too. So that was a that was the the nugget, the initial idea, um, and the paper sort of ballooned from there in the process of trying to spell that out in the correct detail, and then presenting it to other people, and then having people say, "Yeah, but what about this other kind of justification that we can give for God?" And then sort of looking carefully into that one and seeing a similar dynamic, and then eventually someone saying, "Well, well, what about this other one?" And then going, you know, the paper just, you know, got larger and larger and larger. And, and it ended up giving, you know, uh, taking a look at uh, three big, three big uh, kinds of accounts of God, what could justify God in permitting evil and suggesting that once we clarify how that, how that process could work, it seems like it results in this problematic symmetry where if God is justified in permitting evil on those grounds, then it seems like we are permitted in per, uh, per, permitting or perpetrating evil on those grounds too. So the paper, uh, it uh, introduces that problem of symmetry in sort of abstractly. 
as a threat and then goes through some examples of uh, views that I think are susceptible to, to that problem. Views that are not outlier views, views that are fairly uh, mainstream views uh, in the tradition of John Hick, for example, the soul making kind of theodicy, the tradition of Flanagan, the free will defense kind of theodicy or kind of uh, answer. And um, in the tradition of Swinburne, um, thinking about God's uh, rights and a more deontological approach to the problem of evil. And that's the main main part of the paper. And then there's there's more stuff added to it that we we can get to um, in in due time. But that's sort of the, I think I, that's how I, what I think about the core of the paper is um, thinking about this this sort of inquit threat of symmetry and then looking carefully at three kinds of traditional ways of thinking of God's justification for evil and um, trying to show that at least on fairly standard assumptions about the various elements, they seem problematic. Is that what the paper looked to be uh, to you guys? <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, Justin, do you have any comments on the kind of um, stage setting kind of phase or anything you want Maybe, to add? Uh, just one one thing I just it might be helpful to give like one concrete example just to make sure you know the audience understands the thought here so that here's here's one um, and let me know Luis if I'm getting something important wrong here but like you know suppose uh, suppose you you find out that um, maybe you see like a, a child you know drowning in a pond you know like a one of Peter Singer's cases, which he uses for totally different purposes. And you believe, oh, well, but all suffering somehow leads to uh, growth in virtue, and that's why God permits it. And in fact, that justifies God in permitting it because uh, growth in virtue is good enough to be worth that cost. You know, fill out the details however you want. And you might think, okay, well, maybe if I let this or if I let this child drown, then, it seems to follow that, you know, maybe in the afterlife or something that that drowning will somehow cause this child to grow in virtue, like they'll learn something from it or, or whatever. Right. Uh, and so I then have a really good reason not to save this drowning child. Uh, in fact, it seems like I probably shouldn't because God is up to something here. <laughs> you know, God's trying to do something good with this and I shouldn't interfere with what God's doing. Um, but then that seems totally wrong, right? It seems like, no, of course, if we know anything, we know you should help the drowning child. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So that was very loosely informally stated, but it's, I take it, that's kind of like an illustration of sort of the core thought in your paper. Yeah, that's right. And the paper just, um, uh, looks at that core thought and, and says, all the natural ways that are coming up into your mind, reader, of of skate wiggling out of this, once you once you sort of firm up what you need for the theodicy to work, those ways get ruled out. Uh, so yeah. once you include that you know, the the necessity that you need for the theodicy, once you include the guarantee from foreknowledge that you that you need for the theodicy, once you include all these things in, then the ways to escape that conclusion get all closed down. So that's right. And maybe incident, I mean, this is not super important or anything, but this is actually something that has uh, bugged me for a long time too. Uh, I haven't worked it out in detail the way that Luis has in this paper, but I remember going way back to when I was first started thinking about the problem of evil and, and looking at the academic literature on it. This was always kind of, so, well, maybe not always, right? But often I would have problems like this, like with a particular approach to the problem of evil, like, wait a minute, doesn't this mess with ordinary morality in some way? Um, so I'm very happy to see this paper because, uh, you know, this is something that theists need to think a lot more about. Yeah, and I'm, I try to be clear in the paper that my, my aim or what I think the paper accomplishes is not uh the the conclusion that no answer to the problem of evil escapes this this problem escapes this challenge 
that there's no way out of it. That's not what I'm trying to do, and I, I try to be very explicit about that. My my interest is exactly what you said: is that uh, is to point out that there's a you know answers to the problem of evil need to be more careful than many of them are. There there are further requirements than just lobbying some some potential good and saying maybe that's it maybe that that's why and and the, you know the, that's it that's the job and there's no uh no further challenges to um the christian uh answer to the problem of evil so the paper is sort of trying to to uh draw attention raise awareness of yes. you know to <laughs> yeah. to uh, further elements that you need to, i think you should keep in mind when you're trying to uh, develop your thinking about the problem of evil. Yeah, and and you know it's one thing that's it's really helpful the way you've structured it, the way you've like, all right, here's a general premise in a general argument for uh, you know against a, a very general approach to the pro like the Odyssey, and then showing how you can kind of adapt it to like these other very general approaches to the Odyssey, because up to this point most of what you see in the literature uh, that kind of touches on this issue is not general. It's like, all right, somebody's looking at a specific theodicy and sometimes an objection comes up to the effect that, oh, this theodicy messes with ordinary morality in some way, right? Uh -huh. but, but I have not seen prior to your paper, someone try to like bring out the problem in its full generality. Um, so anyway, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yes. I'll just uh, so before we get into the um, like the nitty gritty details and before we get into like the section on symmetry and whatnot, I think the final thing that I want to do for stage setting is maybe to, to at least say for the audience, what exactly are the rock and the hard place that the theist may very well be getting themselves caught in. So um, uh -huh. just to make that very, very clear for the audience, Luis, if you want to if you want to say that. Yeah. Um, so that's uh that's the framing of the discussion um the argument this what i call the symmetry argument the argument that threatens the conclusion that uh, if god is permitted to if god is justified in permitting some evil then we are justified in permitting that evil as well the argument that leads to that conclusion depends on a premise that i call reasons which is the claim that if god exists um if the kind of god that we're talking about this perfect god the god that loves us and so on exists then for any evil that we see god has justifying reasons justifying moral reasons to permit that evil that that's a premise that i call reasons a principle and i i start the paper by noting how um uh, how much of a a historical consensus there has been around this idea that if God is really the good God that we think he is, then he can't just permit pointless evil, permit evil to befall us without having any good reason for doing that. He must have something. That's that's why we feel the need to explain. That's why we feel the need. That's why some of us feel like there's something um, uncomfortable about evil or something incompatible about evil and so on, because we feel like there needs to be some kind of explanation or justification um but there's been a recent trend in philosophy religion of arguing in in very sophisticated ways that maybe that principle is false maybe it's not the case that for every evil that we see god needs to have a justifying more reason for permitting it in order to be the kind of god that we think he is and um i i have a little bit i have some cheeky things to say <laughs> about uh that kind of approach i think it's very implausible uh, it it really uh, uh smacks of incoherence to me to say that god is a god that loves and cares for me in the you know in, in some sense of loving and caring that is similar to the ways that we understand what it means to love and care and also say that God permits horrific things to happen to me or could permit horrific things to happen to me without having any good reason whatsoever uh, for permitting it. Um, 
so that to me is one of is that's maybe the rock or the hard place it's that's one one way to go is to, to take the problem is to say to to address the problem of evil is to say god doesn't need any reasons so that seems like the rock to me that's you know if you go that route you're going to founder on on that and the paper is saying you know well obviously you know that's why the whole tradition has been accepting reasons and developing things to say about reasons but what this paper is going to show is that if you accept reasons you're you're going to fall into the symmetry argument or you're going to face the symmetry argument and then you're going if you accept reasons now you're going to be facing the conclusion that we're we are justified in permitting all the evils that we see as well and that's the hard place that's not good either so your choice here seems to be you either accept or if you're a christian who believes in in, in god in the kind of god we're talking about you either accept reasons or you deny reasons the idea that god uh, you know if he exists he has justified more reasons to permit the evil that we see if you deny that you end up saying these uh what i think are borderline incoherent things uh, about god allowing horrific things without having good reasons for it if you accept reasons instead you end up having to say that we are permitted in we are justified in permitting evil uh ourselves so that's sort of the the rock and the hard place that the answer the, i think that the christian answer to the problem of evil has to steer away in between them it's very unfair what i say about the the denial of the principle of reasons in the paper i don't argue or justify my derision <laughs> for it but yeah well i don't know if this counts as preliminary or getting into the details but i did have an interpretive question about reasons i wasn't sure if i understood exactly where the line is being drawn between theodicies that say, yes, God does have a morally justifying reason for permitting horrendous evils, and th theodicies that say, no, God doesn't, and that's okay, or whatever. Um, and I think I think what threw me off is like, so one, one way I could see somebody drawing this line is by saying like, well, um, you know, there are people who say that God is beyond moral evaluation. Like, it's just moral reasons don't apply to God or moral evaluation doesn't apply to God. God is not the kind of agent to which uh, moral evaluation is even relevant. And so um, uh, people like uh, Brian Davies, uh, uh, Hugh McCann defend views like this. I think you cite a lot of these people. Mark Murphy has a, a kind of qualified version of a view like this. And there I can I can kind of understand that distinction, right? Because you might think, okay, well, God has reasons for not intervening, but they aren't moral reasons or morally justifying reasons, and they don't have to be. Whereas then the, the other theodicies say, no, there needs to be morally justifying reasons, and here they are, you know. But you listed on the side of, you know, theodicies that reject this reasons principle uh, you also included people like Hasker and Van Inwagen, who defend a version of the view that God can permit gratuitous evil. Uh, but I don't think they're thinking about it in the same way as the people who say that God is just sort of beyond moral evaluation. I think what they're thinking is God has good reasons for letting evils happen, even if those evils aren't going to have like good consequences or something, something along those lines, right? But if you ask like, well, why? they're gonna give a story that sounds like a moral sort of story, right? A story that's like, oh, well, you know, Van Inwagens is something about vagueness, like there's no way to draw a non-arbitrary line, so there can't be a moral demand to draw a non-arbitrary line, right? Um, and then Haskers is something like, well, God uh, he needs to allow evils that don't have good consequences because otherwise moral motivation would be undermined, but it's, it would be like morally problematic to undermine moral motivation, something like that. I mean, these are extremely rough characterizations of these views. But um, I mean, do, am I? Is my question clear? Is is or yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So there's two, um, there's two group, two ways, two different ways that um, some philosophers' views get excluded by the principle I call reasons, mm -hmm. and and. Both, you're right that I'm excluding both of those groups, but I'm exclude, they get excluded for different reasons, uh, so to speak, on, on, on different grounds. So there's the, the group of philosophers who think that moral reasons just don't apply to God. Yeah. Um, and 
and the principle says that they do and they need to apply to God. So they, they are denying that principle. That's one way of doing it. The, but that's not Hasker and Vennenwagen. You're right about that. What gets Hasker and Vennenwagen uh, out of the boat when it comes to my principle of reasons is that the principle is individuated, individuates or connects the justification that God needs to have to each specific instance of evil. Got it. And neither Van and Wagen nor, nor Hasker think that that's required of God, right? Both Van and Wagen and Hasker think that God is uh, required to have moral justification. He needs to have a good story to tell about why he has permitted the evil that we see. But they don't think that God needs to have a story to tell about every single instance of evil and explain why he allowed that instance of evil to occur. The stories okay. they get, for, Van Wagen is, is very explicit about this. You mentioned that he, he involves vagueness, right? So for Van Wagen, for his view, part of God's plan is to allow a large amount of evil so that people get, uh, you know, uh, a, a strong sense of what life away from God really is and, and decide freely to turn to God uh, in light of awareness of what a life a horrible life is away from God. And that Van Wagen asks, how large must this amount of evil be? Uh, how much of this evil? What kind of evil? Uh, what exactly must can God include in this set of very large evil to accomplish this goal? And he says, that's like asking how tall someone has to be in order to, to perform some task where you need a tall person. There's a vague boundary. There's going to be individual evils that can definitely, it, it's definitely the case that God need not allow this particular evil in order to accomplish his goal of having a large amount of evil. Uh, but there's, they, they, they're they included because there's a vague boundary. He can't eliminate every single one going one by one. And otherwise he would end up with, you know, uh, no heap. So yeah. for Van Wagen and for Hasker, the issue that gets them off the boat with the respect to my principle of reasons is that they don't think that God needs uh, to have a justification for every single instance of evil, uh, whereas I, I do think that, and I, I can say more about why, but I do think that God needs that. I see, yeah. Okay, so the question is about um, free will theodicies. It seems like you're definitely classifying at least some free will theodicies on the side of theodicies that endorse this reason's premise. It also seems like at least some theodicies, re, uh, free will theodicies, reject the reason's premise in kind of the same way that Hasker and Van Inwagen do, right? Because right. Um, I think maybe Swinburne, for example, is going to say, like, look, there are some evils that happen because somebody did a bad thing. And there is no reason why that bad thing had to happen in order for God to have a world where people have significant freedom or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but God nevertheless permits it because in order to have a world like that, God has to have this general policy of non-intervention or something like that, right? And that sounds structurally pretty similar to the Van Inwagen and Hasker yeah. type story. Uh, it looks like it probably rejects reasons. It does. I think it would. And in the when I'm working through the particular versions of the views that I'm that I'm interesting interested in rejecting or challenging, I'm only interested in versions of them that respect Got reasons. Got it. And uh, there there are other versions of any of these views that are in tension with reasons, but I they would just fall on the side as I've mentioned in the framing of the nine reasons, which I think is, is, um, is a mistake. So versions like that, let me, maybe this is a good time to say why I think rejecting reasons is such a mistake, rejecting reasons in the, in the form that I have it, where it requires God to have a justifying more reason for every instance of evil, right? Not just the general policy. So I think all general policy views are problematic. Um, and the re you know, there's different philosophers have, different views on, on what it takes for something to justify God, right? What kind, there's various constraints that are suggested. And I'm trying to be very ecumenical in just keeping justifying more reasons as a very broad term. And you tell me what you think justifies God, and that's good enough for me, as long as you think that, you know, something needs to be done. But where, where I get 
my constraint in is exactly in this requirement that every instance needs to be justified yeah. as opposed to just um, just just some broad claim about the need for Evo in general or some general policy. And here's why. I'm interested in the kind of God that, um, you know, when when I grew up and um, I grew up as as um, as a Christian believer, and I believed in a kind of God that loved me personally, that cared for me personally, that had an interest in having a relationship with me personally, uh, not a God that is some cosmic administrator, that is some cosmic CEO, or you no know, balancing some 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 spreadsheet and figuring out how much evil needs to exist in the aggregate to accomplish certain goals of the corporation. And to me, if someone, you know, what I understand love and care to be, many of these answers to the problem of evil, they may well justify the existence of a kind of God, and they may, may be good enough. And that might even be perfection in some very abstract sense of um, that, that we can, you know, philosophically carve out. But it doesn't seem to me that that God loves me in particular and cares me about me in particular if that God allows things to happen to me without having a good reason for allowing it. If God sees that this is going to happen, knows it's going to hurt me, um, understands how to prevent it, and sees no reason whatsoever not to prevent it, that particular one, and says, you know what? I'm not going to do anything about that. Um, I already have my general policy, and to me, that's that may be fine in, in in some version of the cosmic God that you care about, but that doesn't sound to me like a God that loves me and cares for me in particular. That's just a different kind of God. So, Got insofar it. as I'm interested in that kind of God, I'm interested in a God that, yeah, for every single instance of evil. Uh, God needs to have a morally justifying reason. Otherwise, that God may be great, but he ain't personally loving and caring for you in particular. Got it. Okay, yeah, that's really helpful. So I think now that I understand more clearly this reasons premise, it also helps me to see exactly where I land in the sort of map that your paper draws, because I think I, I'm pre I reject reasons. Yeah, uh, where do you I land? Right, yeah, I didn't know that until now, but now I do. Uh, I mean, I knew it in some sense, but uh, yeah. So you don't think I, God loves me. Is that what you're telling me? You don't think God loves me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that's, I mean, I, I it might be a, a consequence of my view. I hope it isn't. But um, so, uh, yeah, maybe someday, I mean, I don't want to get us too off track, but maybe someday we can have a discussion about the views that reject reasons um and whether you know what what would someone like me say about these worries about like divine love and care for individual people and so forth yeah uh but yeah no that's that's very helpful um cool you know i appreciate you bracketing that off so that we can um go through the paper uh justin so um i guess we've got a lot of the stuff about um the kind of first overall introductory section and i know you luis you have already introduced the the threat of symmetry. I don't know if you want to um, spell it out further because Justin may have further things to say about the argument in particular, but maybe you can just tell the audience like what exactly is the symmetry argument and um, how, how is it sort of situated in your paper before we get into like the, the three different ways of trying to um, break symmetry or whatever. Yeah, so I'll say very quickly, um, there is a, there's a, um, a more well-discussed related issue to the issue I'm trying to raise, which is the threat of skepticism, of moral skepticism, right? So there's been several replies to work on the problem of evil, it specifically replies to skeptical theism, which is one way of trying to um, um, block challenges from evil by saying that, uh, in, you know, in, in more sophisticated ways, but essentially saying that we shouldn't expect to be able to see God's reasons uh, for permitting the evil, uh, given that we are so limited and God is uh, so unlimited. Uh, so we shouldn't be so surprised that we can't tell why God has permitted various things to happen. 
And one of the responses to that and, and other kinds of similar moves in the literature is to say, well, if you if once we start to make these claims about our limitations, we start to get in a, we, we start to get a picture where we can't tell anymore in general what's right or wrong or what reasons there are and so on. We end up being so badly calibrated. The pictures that were so badly calibrated to the moral facts or to the justifying facts were so bad at figuring out uh, what justifies what that who knows, maybe the things that we thought we knew about justification and morality are wrong too. If, if stuff as horrific as, as genocide turns out could be justified, uh, we're just, it just, that means that we're so uh, misguided in our thinking about what justifies what that all bets are off, right? And so you should just say, I just don't know what, you know, I'm, I'm now a moral skeptic about what justifies what. That's sort of the threat of skepticism that has been discussed before. And I sort of introduced that to sort of locate the threat that I'm talking about, which is a stronger challenge, right? Which is a challenge that it's not that it turns, you know, the answers to the problem of evil may lead you to be us to put your hands in the air and say who know and say who knows what justifies what i'm just going to be you know skeptic about that i'm agnostic it's rather that given what you're saying about the problem of evil now you have to you're forced to conclude that you're actually justified in permitting evil as well uh, you can go out and perpetrate evil and you will be justified in doing that so that's a worse conclusion it seems to me than the moral skepticism and it's it, there's a I think a higher burden to uh, a proof here. There's a higher bar to clear to to uh, pull off that charge. But that's the kind of charge that uh, the, the symmetry argument is uh, is considering. So the the reason the premises of the symmetry argument are the premise I call reasons that says that for every uh, if God exists, then for every instance of evil, God has a justifying moral reason for allowing that evil. And then the second premise of the symmetry argument is what I call the symmetry premise that says that if God is justified, if God has more, is justified or has uh, justified more reasons for permitting some particular instance of evil, then we have justified more reasons for permitting that instance of evil as well. And if you have those two premises together, the result is that for any, if God exists, then for any instance of evil, uh, we are permitted in permitting that evil as well. Um, so denying the second premise is the challenge that I that I give to theodicies and defenses when it comes to the problem of evil. You need to give me a response to the problem of evil that has the resources to reject premise two of this argument and defend the opposite of it, or the denial of it, which I call asymmetry. Yeah, and then so just for the audience, asymmetry would just basically be saying that. Um, um, no, it doesn't follow from the fact that God has justifying moral reasons for allowing evil. that we then also have justifying moral reasons for allowing that particular instance of evil E. There could be a kind of asymmetry there between um, God's justifying moral reasons and our justifying moral reasons. So um, that, that's for the audience. And I also liked, uh, I liked your, your uh, line in the paper where it's like, in a disturbing mirror image of the old Dostoyevskian adage, <laughs> we can rephrase this conclusion as an equally ominous slogan, if God exists everything is permitted so <laughs> i i like that i love that line that was good um so so justin um any comments on on this particular section on, on the threat of symmetry uh actually no i think um not really other than you know so if you were if like apparently like me you reject reasons then you don't have to deal with the symmetry problem um or at least not given the way that the argument is currently set up but mm -hmm. i do have thoughts about the symmetry premise that i'll bring up as we go along and maybe you know we'll see if there's anything that can be said in defense of asymmetry for people who do accept reasons um so yeah i i say let's carry on okay awesome reject so, reasons yeah. you're you're already on the rock justin you don't have to deal with the hard place Absolutely. So, and you know, I mean, geology is kind of a cool subject. So rocks, they're not that bad. <laughs> All right. So uh, for the audience, now we're going on to three different ways. Um, we're going to successfully go through them, but three different ways that um, the, the theist defender of, um, in response to the problem of evil, how they might try to break that kind of symmetry. So um, the first one appeals to um, necessary evil. 
So let's I just turn it over to Luis to talk about firstly, like what is this? What is this way? Like what is this appeal? And then secondly, how do you respond to it? Does it in fact break symmetry, or is it does it just land us back in symmetry? Yeah. So um, this is the kind of response to problem of evil that is familiar uh, from the work of John Hick, for example. Sometimes they're called soul making uh, theodicies or greater good theodicies. Um, the the core of the suggestion is that there are some goods that cannot exist or cannot be instantiated, cannot be brought about without the existence or permission or or instantiation of some evils. Uh, and the connect where the connection between them is logical, right? Not even an omnipotent God could um, bring about some this particular good without bringing about some particular evil. So examples of it might be some virtues like mercy, um, uh, perseverance, uh, um, some some goods related to achievement or um, things like that. Right, um, you, they would be, you know, uh, out of place if there was no difficulty that you had to overcome, or that you're experiencing, or that you're facing, uh, in order to have that. So what the section does is, is first, it tries to fill out the details of what else needs to be the case for that kind of answer to make sense. Right? It can't just be that, oh yeah, there's a logical connection between these two things, therefore, it's all good. It has to be that the thing they're pointing out is, you know, axiologically speaking, a much greater good than the thing that it costs is uh, an evil, right? It needs to outweigh, in some axiological sense, the uh, the value, the disvalue of the evil, right? So that's one, and that's typically the most uh, obvious and most discussed uh, component of this kind of answer. But then I mentioned that. There's a, you know, people presume this second component, but it's, you know, it's not to be taken for granted uh, that it, it must not only outweigh. Sometimes things get outweighed in value, but they're not, they don't thereby justify the trade-off, right? So it must be also the case that what you're identifying uh, justifies the trade-off. It outweighs axiologically speaking, but normatively speaking, it also justifies you in picking the trade-off. Right. So I like I, I mentioned some examples of things that have been suggested and I mentioned uh, one of them, which I don't think really counts as a good justification, uh, even if it, you know, on some views might be the outweighing. Um, but I just love the fact that this is something that occurred to Plantinga as a potential suggestion of an outweighing good when he mentions the magnificent bearing of pain as uh, a potential a uh, greater good that could be connected to evils and and so to you know to someone might say maybe that outweighs in value uh but does it really justify the permission the taking of the trade off that's a further question at least for the conversation and then i had a third condition that i think is the one that's least discussed in 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 when people are talking about these views which is uh it's not enough that there is this axiological connection and this normative fact that if you if this thing occurs, it justifies this. It also needs to be the case that this thing will actually occur for you to be justified in permitting it. Specifically, once we have into the picture God's foreknowledge, the fact that He knows in advance whether the thing is going to occur or not. Right. So God is not uh, uh, taking risks here. On, on I'm assuming in this part of the paper, I should say, I guess the uh, a more a traditional picture of God's providential foreknowledge where God does know in advance um, everything that's going to happen. And I'll, I address later in the paper the um, different views about this. But on the assumption that God does know what's going to happen, he knows whether or not this thing, call it A, which, per assumption, if it occurs, if it actually occurs, it justifies the permission of B, which is, which is bad, Suppose that God also knows that it won't occur. If he permits B, turns out that A won't occur for other reasons. Um, then it's 
true in one sense that A justifies B. It's true in this theoretical sense that A is more value than B, that A uh, is enough to, if A occurred, it would justify permitting B and so on. But it's, it, it's simply not the case that A does justify B because A didn't occur and God knew of it. So in order to be the kind of thing that would, in order to have an explanation of evil that turns on these kinds of connections, the axiological and the normative connections between greater goods and evils, uh, assuming God's foreknowledge, it needs to be the case that uh, the things God is permitting are connected to goods that will, in fact, that God knows, as a matter of fact, uh, that will occur, right? And once you have those three elements, I think you have the kind of answer in full that we're talking about. I, I term, I coined the term pointless evil in this, in, in this section to be an evil that either is not connected in the right way to a greater good, you know, it doesn't outweigh a greater good, or it doesn't, or it's not outweighed by a greater good, or it's not justified by a greater good that outweighs it, or that even though it has those relations, it's not going to occur anyway, right? So that's a pointless evil on one, on any of those counts. God, if God permits an evil like that, uh, even if it has those connections, but it doesn't come to a, to pass, that wasn't uh, that wasn't a, a, a justified permission by God. So once we have that, we have then this a version of this view that is complete that says that. Uh, God's justification for permitting an evil, uh, that, uh, sorry, that uh, God's justification for permitting any evil is that the evil is not pointless, right? It's, it outweighs, is outweighed by some good, it is justified by that good, and that good is guaranteed to occur. That's why God has permitted. So that's the full kind of picture of that count that I'm talking about. Um, again, if once you have those three elements baked into the, the view, and I I'm, I say baked in, but I'm, I'm trying to motivate them as, as requirements of the view. If you're going to try to actually say what justifies God, you have to fill in these de details. And uh, once you have those details in, then it turns out that there's no evil that actually occurs that is not connected to a greater good that outweighs it, that justifies its permission and that will actually occur in the future, right? There's never pointless evil in the world, according to this explanation. And, um, but that's, so that's just lending, that's the kind of thing that will lend us back into the symmetry uh, premise, right? Because now we've stipulated that what gives God's reason, what give, gives God reasons is some objective fact about the relation between these things and not something particular about God. Right? Is the justifying power of the outweighing relation between this greater good and this evil and the, the guaranteed fact that it will occur. So I can be confident that if I, uh, if I punch someone and harm them, if that actually happens, if, if God doesn't intervene, then that evil, by necessity, is connected to a greater good that justifies my punching someone and that will in fact come about in some way at some time, right? So there's nothing that I can do that is not going to be connected to some greater good that justifies uh, doing that thing. So that's the main, uh, the main line of uh, explaining why we fall into this problem. Cool. So um, I have one sort of nitpicky thought here that I uh, that I think probably doesn't really affect your argument much, uh, but I think the best way to draw this distinction that you're drawing using the notion of divine foreknowledge is actually more like the distinction between risk-taking and risk-free models of providence that Hasker talks about. Uh, and I think it better, and you did actually, you mentioned risk at one point, so you kind of are using both characterizations, but I would stick with the risk characterization rather than the foreknowledge characterization, just because of this really picky point that um, a lot of uh, uh, foreknowledge folks are actually risk 
risk takers about providence because they think that foreknowledge is providentially useless. It just, it comes too late explanatorily for God to use it. Uh, and unless you allow explanatory loops, which some people do, uh, David Hunt, for example. But um, I think that's just a, a tiny picky thing about the way I would prefer to, to set up that point. Ultimately, you still have things to say both about risk-free providence views and risk-taking providence views, and those are going to be roughly the same comments, however this distinction is drawn. Uh, does that seem right to you? Yeah, and but I and I do maybe this since we're talking about risk, I can add here that the paper uh, repeats the 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 section of the on, on the necessary evil that I'm talking about introduces at length two different arguments or argumentative strategies, and then mm -hmm. the rest of the paper more quickly sort of like repeats those those moves, yeah. right? Yeah. So one move is what I talked about is you give me the details of what it takes to justify God. Uh, if that's the fact you're talking about, then it turns out that we're um, we're justified as well. And then the second move that I make in this section, and then I repeat later on, is that wait a second. Uh, one way of talking about morale or understanding morality, or thinking about justifying more reasons, is to be a per perspectivalist. About yeah. That, right. Is to think that, um, and this this is where some of the issues about risk uh, come in from our side. Is to think that what gives you justifying what what justifying reasons you have depend on the information that's available to you from your perspective. What justifying reasons I have depends on the information that I have available from my perspective. And the fact that the objective fact that some action is going to have some great good is neither here nor there when it comes to determining whether I have justifying reasons for doing something or not. What matters is what information about the consequences or about whatever you think is relevant do I have available from my perspective? That's what matters for justification, right? So there's this perspectivalist, objectivist sort of distinction that you can pick where you think, uh, how you think in general about, about you know, more evaluation and, and, and moral theory in general. And what I say in the paper is that if you make that move to try to defend against uh, my first argument by saying, God knows if something's guaranteed to occur. I don't know if something's guaranteed to occur. So I you know, I, I can't take that risk. Um, what I say is that, wait a second, but if I accept this answer, the necessary evil account, and if I'm justified in accepting that, this is the, the target that I'm interested in, someone who has good reasons to believe this, who's proposing this as a theory, if that's the position that I'm in, then I can have, on the basis of my justified acceptance of this, I can... Uh, be justified in believing that nothing that I do will matter. Nothing that I do will be a pointless evil either. So I can also act on that basis. And uh, so you, once it, you either stay on the objectivist side and conclude that uh, the, the objective fact of the connection between the evil and the good justifies both God and justifies me, or you go perspectivalist, but then you have to say that insofar as, as, as I'm justified in accepting this view. And uh, to be clear, if you're not justified in accepting this view, then you shouldn't accept it. And the view shouldn't be, you know, something that, that, you know, you're proposing. But if you, if you are justified in accepting, if you think that this is something that you have good reason to accept, and that's why we're discussing it, well, then you're justified in accepting the consequences of it. And one of the consequences of it is that um, nothing that you do will ever be pointless. No, no yeah. evil that you perform will ever be pointless. So you're justified in acting on that. So you have the the, you know, the risk that's typically introduced by perspectivalism gets uh, gets uh, eliminated from the from your from your perspective by virtue of the thing that you're justified in believing in. Yeah, and it's a nice little dilemma, right? Like, so it's either objectivism or perspectivalism, and whichever way you go, you've got problems, right? You know, it yeah. looks like symmetry is going to turn out to be true. Um, so I do not. I am not a big fan of this form of theodicy uh, that says the evil itself is necessary for some justifying good. But let me, for a second, you know, uh, put on put on the hat of of somebody who likes this sort of theodicy and see, like, okay, what what could I say here if I'm trying to get out of this problem? I think one thing that might be worth trying is to say something like. Um, well, 
All right, suppose you're justified in believing uh, a theodicy of this sort. And so you believe that in fact, each evil will result in some good that justifies, you know, not preventing that evil, right? Or even bringing it about, right? You can be justified in believing something and still have a fairly low credence in it. Uh, in fact, I am sort of attracted to the view that you can even have a less than a credence of less than 0.5 in some things that you're justified in believing. Um, I don't like the threshold views uh, about the relationship belief belief between belief and credence, right? Uh, but actually, even if even if you have a pretty high credence, like I don't know, uh, maybe like 0.9 credence that some theodicy of this sort is true, you might think, but wait a second there's still risk here and it's all on one side because no matter what I do, I'm not going to be able to mess up God's plans, right? I can't stop God from doing whatever it is God has set out to do. And so I could try to prevent this evil and I don't have to worry about messing up God's plans. But on the other hand, I could, it, what, what happens if I let the evil happen? Uh, well, now I'm taking up serious risk, and that is the risk that I'm wrong about my theodicy, and this evil is actually gratuitous, and I should have prevented it, right? And so you might think that in that situation, you do have an obligation to intervene, whereas God doesn't, because God is going to be certain uh, about the correct theodicy, right? Uh, I don't know. What do you think about that move? <clears throat> I think that's it's it's an interesting suggestion, and I think that's the kind of um, elaboration that when I wrote the paper, I was hoping and urging uh, theists working on the problem of evil to do right because you're here. Notice how you're introducing and appealing to uh, very interesting and controversial views in other areas in epistemology, you know, in epistemology, for example, to uh, to make the view work out, and I think that's yeah, that's that's the kind of interesting stuff that uh, answering the problem of evil requires commitments that you might be uncomfortable with, like the ones that you're suggesting between the, the relation between credence and justification. But that aside, um, so here's what I, I some things that come to my mind. First, I think it's good to note that uh, there's still this awkward correlation that I think is theoretically puzzling. Uh, where the more justified, the more rationally confident you are in this answer, the less you have to care about evil and yeah. the evil that you do, right? Yeah. That's sort of, I find it theoretically odd, right? That the more, you know, if if my rational confidence in this gets increased by whatever means, then I can go around doing the, the more evil and without, without concern. Um, that seems odd to me. And you, the way you, you've outlined that, the, the view that you've outlined doesn't seem to escape that awkwardness. Uh, but the other thing I would say is that even if you don't think that cre the rational credence, uh, the level, your level of rational credence uh, is neatly correlated with your level of justification, um, there's a lot of work uh, on the, what is the norm of action, right? What, what is it that justifies you in acting in some way? And most of that work, or much of that work at least, is in terms of justified beliefs, right? If you're justified in believing something, you're permitted to act on it. Uh, or knowledge be the norm of action. And and for most people working in this space, knowledge is a fallibilist uh, kind of knowledge where you, you don't re you're not required to have maximal justification. So presumably you're not required to have maximal rational confidence in order to know either. So on both of those kinds of accounts, uh, you will be permitted to act on your belief in this necessary evil explanation because you're justified in believing it, or you know it perhaps, uh, even if you have low rational confidence in it. So the uh, it wouldn't be enough to merely draw that distinction that you're drawing uh, to uh, to escape, I think, the issue. And the last thing to that that comes to my mind is that listen, any view you have about the your eternal post-mortem fate is risky 
is something that comes with risks that might affect that you shouldn't be incredibly rationally confident uh, anyway. So I that that moves me to think that we're going to have to be okay with action uh, that has you know eternal consequences uh, on the basis of of low rational credence anyway. And this is just going to be another instance of that. And if you tell me that it, I'm justified, I have low rational credence, but I'm justified, I'm, I'm likely to think, well, that's good enough for action. It's good enough for action in most cases. That's good enough for action here. But so that's not a recommendation of what you said. Yeah, Justin, I'll, I'll let you add any comments that you want, but we do need to get on to the necessary permission um, kind of theodicies. So I'll, I'll just let you say any final things for Justin, and then we need to move on. Sure, yeah. And actually, I'll, all I'll say um, is the the I think it was the first worry, maybe the second worry you raised. Uh, I had thought of something similar, the worry about, well, but the you know the higher your confidence is, the 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 more um oh how did you put it i don't remember how you put it but um yeah, the, 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 less, the less you have to care about the evil less you have to care yeah i had um sort of an in a more inchoate uh objection along those lines in my head and i i was i wanted to mention that that's my biggest concern about the suggestion i made as well it there's something like it's like you might be able to preserve like yes technically you should save the drowning child but it seems like the the levels of risk and stuff, it, it's not going to be quite right. It's not what we normally think that it is, something like that. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, let's turn it over to Luis to talk about what necessary permission theodicies are and whether they can help break the symmetry. I'm not the first one to note that there are some weird consequences if you think that every evil is connected to some greater good. Um, Steve Weichstra, for example, uh, that's his self-conscious reason to, to not accept a necessary evil kind of um, account of God's justification for, for evil, um, uh, even though it's not developed as carefully as I've tried to point out. But that the main move then is to say, listen, maybe there are some evils that are pointless in the sense that we that, that we have uh, defined. They're not necessarily connected to some greater good that justifies the permission of that evil and that will actually occur. But God's permission of that pointless evil is necessary in a similar sense. God's permission um, is... Um, is justified and uh, um, even if the greater the, the thing that the evil uh, is connected to is not uh, greater good or not justifying or not or is not going to happen so what kind of thing could play that role uh, how can we understand the necessary permission uh, answer uh, so the main Contender here, this is where the planning a uh, tradition of the free will defense comes in. The main contender is the free is free will, right? Uh, this, when you think about why free will could be a, an answer to why God permits evil, the answer is not because every one of my free actions is connected to some greater good, some further greater good, right? Some consequence that justifies the free action that I performed. It's rather that. Uh, that God is eyeing, right? That God is thinking about and trying to to accomplish is rather that God is thinking that um, the freedom itself is the good, and if I intervene, if I intervene, then there is no freedom. Then there isn't the greater good, even though uh, the evil that's coming out of that is not connected to any, you know, it's not bringing about any other good. So that's the so the the necessary permission account then says that. Um, if there are some, uh, for some reason, all actual instances of evil is the fact that uh, permitting that evil is not pointless, that gives God justification for allowing it, right? And, and the free will uh, account is, is just one way of filling this in, and it's the way that I discussed, because I think it's the most natural way of trying to understand what would permit God to allow pointless evil, and it's the way that gets discussed by Planiga and, and others. Uh, thinking about this kind of view, 
but uh, there are other ways of filling that in as well. And so maybe I'll say why in this case, I think there's a problem, right? So um, if you're thinking of free will, um, once you start thinking of, wait, wait a second, why was that or how would that justify God? What's going on in the mechanism here that my, my freedom justifies God in permitting something? Um, then you, you, you're quickly forced to see that it's not what God needs to permit or what needs to happen here. It's not just that God needs to let me uh, intend some evil or wish some evil or um, or want to do some evil or try to do some evil and so on. Uh, God could permit all those things. If those were the things that matter, God could allow all those things without allowing me to actually perform any evil. Um, so that wouldn't work. It has to be that what's really valuable is me really carrying out my intention to uh, to perform some evil action or to perform any action at all. Uh, that's the thing that um, God is required to permit in order to achieve the greater good that justifies God in permitting in in, in permitting the evil that is not connected to anything else. But once you understand that what's doing the work here is my actually performing the action, not just my wanting or trying to perform the action, that somehow God needed to let it go all the way, then again, then that's true whether or not God is the one interfering. The greater good only happens if I actually perform the evil action. And you intervening with my performing that action blocks the greater good from coming into existence just as much as God interfering with me doing the great going doing my evil action. So there's no asymmetry to be found in this case because what is really required for the good is that I actually carry out what I'm doing. And same move against with again with the perspectivalism. Uh, once you go perspectivalist, if you have a justified belief in that view, then you can act as if it is true and have the same problem. The comments that I had on this part of the paper, uh, as I think you pointed out, are kind of like suggesting like, all right, here's a different way to go. Uh, like it's sort of like, it's not really saying uh, that there's anything wrong with your objection to this kind of theodicy. It's just saying something more like, oh, there's a nearby neighbor to this kind of theodicy that might get around the worry that might justify asymmetry. Yeah. Um, so here's here's uh, you know what I kind of said in those comments. So it seems like, and you you've you've already mentioned this distinction. There's an important distinction between you know uh, a theodicy which says that God has a good reason not to prevent the evil, and a theodicy that says everyone has a good reason not to prevent the evil, right? And so what a person who's attracted to theodicies in this general neighborhood needs to do, I think, is find one of the first kind, where it's God and only God, and not also us, who has a reason not to prevent the evil. And there are some theodicies that have this structure. Now, whether or not they're any good as theodicies is a whole other question, right? But just to give two examples very briefly, the sort of broadly Swinburne kind of uh, free will theodicy, which says that what God wants is for people to be responsible for the good stuff that happens in the world, right? Well, in order for the thought is in order for people to be responsible for it, God has to leave it up to us. God has to have a no intervention policy of some sort so that what happens in the world, whether it goes well or poorly, is to some extent up to us, right? Uh, and so that gives God a reason not to intervene to stop us even when we're going to go wrong. Because if God it has a policy of, well, intervene if they're going to go wrong, then it's not really up to us whether things go well or poorly. Uh, God is overseeing things in such a way that they're guaranteed to go well. Um, but uh, that doesn't give us a reason not to intervene and stop evil because we are... <laughs> part of the people whom God is trying to leave things up to. So if I intervene and stop somebody, then that's an instance of the good that God is aiming for, right? Namely, things going well in the world because we brought that about and not God, 
right? So that would be one example. And then another example, there are theodicies that try to make a big deal out of gnomic regularity, like the fact that the world runs according to natural laws. And the, and the thought is there's supposed to be something really either valuable or in some way important about things running in accord with natural laws and God not interfering in that or not interfering in it too much, right? And, and there's another case where, okay, every time God interferes in the world, uh, you might think that's going to mess with gnomic regularity. Uh, and so that's uh, that detracts from this good that God is trying to bring about or preserve. But my interfering to prevent an evil doesn't detract at all from gnomic regularity because anything I can do to prevent an evil is subject to the laws of nature and is in accord with the laws of nature. So, uh, so I guess, anyway, overall thought, what the theodicist who likes the kind of theodicy you're criticizing here, I think needs to do is go for that variant of it or that version. Um, and there may be ways to do that. I mean, you know, there certainly have yeah. been. Steps. Yeah, I, I would say that no one is going for the theodicy that explicitly says that there's symmetry, right? No, uh, no one, you know, you said that you can either go for one or the other. I don't think anyone sort of, you know, starts out, <laughs> you know, saying, hey, let's get the theodicy that uh, you know, permits us to do evil. I think it's you get it, it turn. You know, it, it's revealed to you sometimes if you know if some of these arguments work that something you thought did not have that result actually has that result, right? And I think uh, so. Yeah, I mean, the question is whether these other ones uh, can be shown once they're fully developed to have this un undesirable result as well or not. Yeah. But what I would say about them. Um, the first thing I would say about both of them, either the responsibilist or uh, the gnomic regularity uh, versions that you mentioned, the first question I have for those is always whether they meet the basic constraint of uh, that is that interests me, given the kind of God I'm interested in examining, whether it exists, uh, whether they explain God's justifying reason for allowing every single instance, the personal instance of evil, right? Whether they're good enough to explain why God, who loves me and cares for me, allowed my child to die so horribly, or my, you know, uh, loved one to experience such excruciating suffering, and so on. And and for example, the gnomic regularity stuff is, is I have a hard time seeing how that kind of theodicy or answer can touch that kind of concern. Um, well, to begin with, the gnomic regularity, I I think most theists already accepts that what God, what has value, if anything has value in this space, is not total gnomic regularity, right? Because theists think that God does intervene and has intervened anyway in the world. So presumably that intervention uh, didn't disrupt whatever overall value of gnomic regularity is. Uh, so intervention per se, whatever the value of gnomic regularity is, is some value that has to do with some Gnomic regularity, right? And I understand the points that Swimmer makes in that connection, where you know, in order to have biological, organic beings like us, you need some kind of gnomic regularity. In order to have the human life, the psychological human life as we understand it, you need to have some kind of gnomic regularity, and so on. But that's compatible with plenty of intervention, um, and uh, and moreover, any explanation appealing to that, we need to we need to show that it justifies God in any particular instance of evil as well, right? And with the responsibilist stuff, I think that's very promising. I think some version of that is a very promising uh, response or view or path out in, 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 in light of the symmetry chat, the symmetry argument. I know you have, I know, well, you have deontological, work on the deontological kind of views. I know John Pittard has work on the responsibilist uh, theodicy space. I know Philip Philip Swenson likes that uh, that view as well. Um, what I would say there simply is, you know, there's need, we need to pay a little bit more attention to the overall, you know, the plausibility of the overall view that we're ending up with, focusing on the particular evils. Are they getting all justified by what you're pointing out? And again, paying attention to the fact that you're gonna you're gonna have to make some. Uh, not uncontroversial theory choices here because there's plenty of views of responsibility where having the the contra causal ability 
uh, that you're talking about is not required for responsibility, right? Uh, Frankfurt cases are supposed to show that you can be morally responsible for things without having the contra-causal ability not to do them. Um, there's plenty of views of more responsibility where uh, responsibility is connected to uh, your, you know, the ways that your plans and intentions and beliefs and so on express your agency, express your values, express your uh, your your good or bad character. And on all those views, uh, you could still have more responsibility. You could even still have bad character, bad bad intentions um, in a world where God was. Uh, you know, in, in enacting a policy of systematic prevention. And you can even have good actions and good morally responsible behavior in that world as well on those views. So here we see a way in which focusing on the symmetry problem, on the symmetry argument, is forcing some interesting theory choice, uh, a, an interesting uh, choice point here on what to think about these theories because you would have now to sort of block them from uh, otherwise the you wouldn't have a necessi necessity of, a per of the permission anymore, right? But again, those are not refutations of the, the points that you made. As, and, but like I said, my aim is not to refute yeah. uh, every possibility, um, just to point out that things are way more complicated than what these initial suggestions see, uh, seem to make them out to be. Yeah, yeah so absolutely. Justin, just very briefly, um, I'll give you like 60 seconds for a response because I think the last thing that we're going to do is go into the um, divine right theodicies and that'll occupy us for the last maybe 10 to 15 minutes of the discussion um, so that we close within the 90 minute um, thing. Um, okay, so yeah, 60 minutes. Okay, or 60 yeah. seconds, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 60 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, no, I realize we do have to keep things moving. So let me just say, I, I agree with almost everything that you just said. Uh, and I think you're right. You know, this problem forces the theodicist to kind of develop things in a certain direction and take a closer look at what happens when we start going that sort of direction. Uh, there are particular issues that you raised that, I could comment on, but I think we would just end up going down rabbit holes about particular theodicy. So let me just leave it at that. Awesome. So then um, the last thing that we're going to cover for our discussion, turning it over to Luis, is going to be divine right theodicies and whether, firstly, what are they? And secondly, do they help break the symmetry? Yeah, so the so far the theodicies I've been talking about, um, they are broadly consequentialist in uh, in nature, right? They think that there, you know, what justifies something is some is the consequences. Uh, what justifies God in permitting evil are the consequences of permitting or not permitting that evil. And uh, what that, in in to use some jargon, what that does is it relies on what we call agent neutral reasons, right? Reasons that um, apply to anyone, uh, no matter what uh, relationship they have to the evil in question. Uh, and one of uh, one of the feature one feature of the ontological approaches to moral theory is that they uh, they tend to focus on what what's called agent relative reasons reasons that only exist for those who are related in the right way to to someone or to something right and um, a divine right theodicy or divine right answer to the problem of evil here is one that it sort of takes on board much of what we've talked about so so far. You know, you still want God to be interested in the consequences, not like anything goes. Uh, but it, it's important that God, given his relationship to us, has the right to allow some things. Uh, whereas we, even in, even given the, the consequentialist connections between the evil and the good, we don't have the right to allow some evil to occur for the sake of the greater good. Right. But once we introduce that distinction, it seems like you can break the symmetry because now God is the one that has the right and we are the ones uh, who don't have the right. So what I do in that section is show that that at least initially doesn't seem to help because uh, once we say that God has the right uh, and once we build in all the other elements of it, too, uh, it turns out that we have other things playing a role here that will give us the permission to do evil, namely that. Typically, if someone has a right to permit 
some greater good, to accept the trade-off where they permit some greater good, uh, where they permit some evil for the sake of some greater good. If they have the right and the authority to make that trade-off, and I don't have the authority to make that trade-off, well, then I also don't have the authority or the right to, in, to uh, intervene with their permission of that trade-off, right? Uh, it comes with their, their right to make the trade-off, and it comes with my not having the right that whatever they decide, it, it, I, I should abide by. So once we put that into the picture, then it turns out that even if we give God this asymmetry in having the right, the result is going to be similar, where it's not going to be like the previous views where the same thing that justifies God ends up justifying us. It's going to be different, but whatever, since God has the justification, uh, since we are su subjected, subject to whatever he decides as being the one with authority, there's something else that's going to justify us, namely this, the, the relation of, of being under the authority of God. If it's good enough for God, this trade-off should be good enough for us, right? So you end up having the symmetry restored in an indirect way on those divine right accounts as well. Awesome. Yeah, okay. So I guess I think I have two main thoughts about divine right theodicies. But first, let me clarify. So um, the last section of the paper about divine duty theodicies, are we kind of... Are we, are we just going to skip that? We are going that? to skip that. Yes, we are going to skip that. The audience, if they want to check that out, they uh, will yeah. have to read the paper. Yeah, I'll just mention very quickly that that's, you know, um, that illustrates uh, how uh, you can have, you know, clearly, I think you can have answers to the problem of evil that avoid the symmetry challenge. I discussed one in the paper. Uh, but the, the problem for any answer is a twofold problem. You have to both be what you, you know, each of us will reasonably disagree on these, these kinds of judgments, but you have to have an answer that is overall plausible as a response to the problem of evil and that avoids a symmetry challenge, right? right? Doing just one of those tasks, whichever it is, doesn't help. And I, these, the three theories we're talking about, I'm saying they, they seem very plausible to me as, you know, things that could justify God, but they seem to fail when in the second test, which is the, the symmetry challenge. And the last one I talk about in the paper, you know, it it seems to succeed at the symmetry test, but at the cost to me, by my lights, of being very, very implausible. And so, you know, that's that's not good either. Okay, cool. Yeah, and we are uh, skipping that. So just turning it over to Justin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, okay. So my two thoughts then about uh, what are the, oh, divine right theodicies. Um, so one thought is... Uh, take the same strategy that I suggested when we were talking about divine permission theodicies and look for uh, a justifying good which um, requires that God not intervene but doesn't require that we don't intervene. Say, uh, you know, tell a story about how God has a right to bring about that good um, and and actually, I mean, I guess in this case, it wouldn't matter uh, uh, what we say about if, if there's an asymmetry between, divi you know, divine right, God having a right and us having a right, because the asymmetry is in, you know, what the good requires, right? Um, uh, but it seems to me like, you know, if you take, for example, Swinburne's free will theodicy, you know, he's he develops this idea that not only, you know, can God bring about this certain kind of responsibility only by, you know, letting us kind of wreak havoc if we so choose, uh, but also God has a right to do so, right? So he, his theodicy is going to have this form of, uh, or at least one might, you know, try to argue that it has this form of like, well, the good requires that God doesn't intervene, but not us. And then that would vindicate asymmetry. So this is just kind of the same point again, yeah. just saying you can use it here as well, I guess. Yeah. So um, the, it's sort of against the spirit of the paper, I should say, for me to be spitballing my reactions to these uh, suggestions that you're giving, right? Because the, the spirit of the paper is that uh, listen, we have to sit down and work out the details of any suggestion 
to to see what it really requires to work and and then to see if if it has this consequence right once you once the once once it, it's made plain all that is required um, but my my intuition here is that a view like that is just inheriting the difficulty the difficulties that we talked about with the other views as well right uh, on the one hand you're inheriting difficulties of the views that uh, don't seem to address the particular nature of the evils that I'm asking, uh, that I'm hoping a theory can explain how God could be justified in permitting in order to be loving and caring for me. Um, if you, if, if the views that you're pairing with divine right are gnomic regularity views or overall freedom policy views and so on, then I just think that's not, that's going to be a no go to me who's interested in, examining the existence of a loving and caring God, a personally yeah. loving and caring God. Uh, on the other hand, it's it's sort of, you're going to have to very carefully articulate how you're combining these views, because the way the views without the right uh, specification, without the divine right specification work, is by specifying relations, normative axiological relations between goods and evils that do the justifying work themselves. So if you're going to combine them with the right stuff, you have to specify similar relations, but relations that are not identical. Otherwise, that's just going to be consistent with the requirement of, of God having the right that we don't have. Right? You need to say something else about these relations. And I would like to see what exactly that turns out to be to see if it has or doesn't have some of the consequences that... Um, that I'm it, that I think some of these views have right. So I want to see if so. To, I, we didn't mention the details of the divine right, my discussion of the divine right, but I want to see how is it that the prima facie duties are working out once you specify what they are when it comes to promotion of the greater good, um, in order for it to not be the case that um, once someone with the right to permit it, with the authority of permitting it, makes the decision. I don't have now the duty to do it as well, right? So maybe there's a way to work that out, but I would have to see the details of it to, to sort of, you know, to, to, to pass judgment on whether that, that's a good alternative. I see. So what I was thinking was, suppose God has a right to permit evil for the sake of some good, call it G, right? Um, a and good that a good that uh, outweighs the evil in the way that we talk about necessary evil theodicies. A good that whose occurrence, actual occurrence, justifies the evil in the way that yeah. we talk in the necessary theodicies, and so on. Right. Yeah. So let's say G satisfies all these conditions. You know, whatever it is. Um, and then the thought is, but as long as you also, and again, of course, the trick is, can this be pulled off? Which I. I take the point. This is not easy to do. But if it's also, if G is also such that it is promoted by God's not intervening, but not promoted by our not intervening, then I don't see how saying God has a right to bring it about is going to affect at all our, what we should do. Yeah, but what I was suggesting is that uh, the, you... Um, Imposing uh, when you when you def try to articulate a view of that kind, it doesn't seem like the right God's right stuff is doing any of the work here. Oh, right? true. And, and so you, yeah. you're just bringing us back into a divine yes. permission theodicy. Divine permission. Yes, yes. That that are by articulating and by stipulating because you haven't given the detail by stipulating that it turns out that the good is only promoted if God permits, not if we permit. Okay. The right stuff is not doing any of the work. Um, but and no, neither is the stipulation, right? We have to see what what is this good and, and is how it, yes. is it that it that it plays out. But anyway, I don't think we're doing a divine right here, kind of theodicy because the right is, is irrelevant. Yeah. So okay. So I agree with that. If you do it the way that I'm suggesting, the the strategy for dealing with the symmetry challenge, the right is not doing any work there. It's it's the same. It's the permission move. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I agree with that. I think that uh, the right does other work, but work that's not particularly sure. right. Because for me, 
one of the things that I mean, you, I guess you probably already know that I focus on in my a lot of my work on the problem of evil is deontological constraints on bringing yeah. about greater goods at the cost of evil. And so I think the rights issue is very important and under discussed in the literature. Like, does God actually have a right to allow these things for yeah. greater goods? But that is, you're right. It's not, uh, given the suggestion I just made, it wouldn't be doing any uh, like distinctive asymmetry type work. Yeah, it's important to, you know, if, if it, you know, it might be true that God needs a right. So that's important to have it on your view. Yeah. But I'm discussing here, I'm trying to focus on um, characteristics of these views that can do the work of the asymmetry, breaking yeah. the symmetry, right? right. And I'm and exploring so maybe, the divine right as an attempt to do that, not just as, a, listen, whatever your view, you need to have this because this is important. It has to be true. Yeah, if, yeah, yeah. If, yeah. Your, view is gonna, if your view is going to be correct. Mm -hmm. So maybe the best way for me to put my point is is this. Um, my thought is, okay, there's a way to deal with the asymmetry problem. And it's uh, at least, I mean, maybe not the only way, but one way to deal with it is to look for goods that require God to not intervene, but not that don't require us to not intervene. And that strategy is available to people who like divine permission theodicies, and also people who like divine right theodicies. Uh, yeah. And so that I think that's what I'm trying to say is yeah. a divine right theodicist can take that approach. But you're right that the, the right part, the right, the divine right, isn't doing the asymmetry work. Yeah. And the view, it, and the view that you're thinking about, it is in other views, right? The view that I discuss, sure. it is the right that does the, that attempts to do the, the symmetry break. Sure. Yes. Fair. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But got it. All right. So um, let's just get into very brief concluding uh, remarks or summaries. I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe um, Luis, if you want to just kind of uh, tie all the threads together and just um, say whatever you want for the last kind of concluding thing, and then I will I'll close this out after you guys both say some some final words. Yeah. Um, I don't know what kind of um, how I can weave things together here. Um, I, I feel like, you know, just just in, as in the paper, I feel I've been rambling about my discontent with various uh, the odysseys uh, without much direction. Um, I think what I'm like, like I said earlier, what I've been trying to show, what what I was trying to show in the paper, and what I've been trying to show in this conversation is not that there are no the odysseys or or views about the problem of evil. That, that escape the symmetry argument, uh, but rather that uh, escaping the symmetry argument um, should be a more focused concern of the Odysseys and, and those who are trying to give answers to the problem of evil and trying to highlight and, and not just saying that and trying to say, okay, let me show you carefully why, right? And show how three of the big uh, ways of responding to the problem of evil uh, seem to have, uh, on natural ways of developing it, seem to lead into uh, the, uh, seem to entail the premise that is problematic, the symmetry premise. Um, so uh, whatever you think, however you think you can escape this, which there are you know, plenty of, of ways of trying, Justin has been mentioning uh, many of them, uh, you, uh, you should pay more attention to those details when you're talking about it. That's one uh, one big takeaway. Another big takeaway for me that I hope people uh, have with reading the paper is uh, the importance of staying honest um, when it comes to um, the kind of God we're trying to justify and what it would take to justify that. I don't think enough attention is paid in discussions of the problem of evil of what it is exactly. Uh, uh, the nature of this God that we're trying to um, explain uh, as compatible or or more than compatible as, as fitting with the nature of the world. I think it's, I don't find it very interesting when we are simply trying to show that some, you know, unmoved mover could exist or some, you know, some Anselmian uh, perfect, perfect, ab abstractly perfect God could exist and so on. I'm interested when I think, you know, when, given uh, the things that, that I think matter in religious life, 
I think the kind of God that it, that I'm trying to understand whether it does or could exist in this kind of world is a personal God that loves and cares for us and loves and cares for me in the way that we understand or in similar ways to what we understand love and care. And I think that imposes constraints on the answers to the problem of evil that, that are plausible and that makes sense. There might be answers that are plausible in explaining evil in some general sense, like I said, where God is some cosmic administrator uh, trying to to achieve some some big picture goals and goods for humanity as a collective uh, entity, but I don't think that's the, that's whatever justifies that doesn't necessarily justify believing in a God that cares for me personally. And um, I think some of the the arguments in my paper are trying to sort of like keep us focused on that uh, more specific task, which you know might not be of interest to everyone, but is what what interests me. Uh, yeah, those are, I guess, two big big takeaways. I I, I thought or hoped uh, the paper would uh, uh, would have for people, um, but I say at the end of the paper, I don't want to feign any completeness in what I've said. I think that there's plenty of of interesting things that you can say uh, in response, and Justin has said a bunch of them. Cool. Yeah, Justin, Thanks. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Oh, all right. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So let me see. I mean, one way of saying what you have already said is, uh, but that it kind of reflects the way that I'm currently picturing the whole issue is, is this. Um, so you've got these two options. You either have a theodicy that rejects reasons or a theodicy that embraces reasons. And either way you go, there's a plausible constraint on theodicy that makes it hard to do the job. If you reject reasons, the plausible constraint that makes it hard to do the job is the constraint that says we want a God who is like sort of an intimate caretaker, lover of individual people, something like that, right? Or at least a God who's enough like that uh, to satisfy, you know, whatever intuitive view you have about what God is like, I guess. Um, on the other hand, if you accept reasons, then the challenge comes from the constraint of asymmetry. We want a theodicy that doesn't undermine ordinary morality. Um, I, uh, and then my, my position is I lean towards reasons is false. Um, and I'm not sure I buy the constraint, uh, at least in the way you're conceiving of it about how divine love and care and so forth. Like how much should that look like human love and care or whatever. Um, but that would obviously be a whole other discussion. And frankly, my thoughts about this are not really yeah. fully worked out. Um, but on the other side, uh, I do think that's a really, the, the asymmetry thing, very important challenge, very important constraint on theodicy. Uh, and there may be some wiggle room there, like we've been talking about, um, but it's certainly something that's been underappreciated in the literature. So happy to see this paper. The, I'll just make one comment about when you said about the denial of reason of reasons, the principle of reasons. Uh, I don't want to suggest it, uh, it may sound the way that you phrase it and the way maybe that I phrase it, uh, that I'm imposing a constraint on theists or Christians as if this is some, you know, I think that you're making some kind of mistake if you don't think of God in that way. Um, I, I don't have any, uh, I don't have a strong view like that. I, what I will suggest is that I'm interested in that kind of God in the, or in the possibility of that kind of God existing. So, I'm thinking about the things that are related to the kind of God I, you know, uh, once thought existed and, uh, you know, think would be a great uh, good if it did exist. If other people care about a different kind of God or don't care about this kind of God in particular, I don't think they're making a mistake. And I don't think they need to take my constraints as being objective constraints on how they think about the problem of evil. We're just interested in different things. That's how, That's what I would say about that. All right. Well, thank you, Luis, and thank you, Justin, for coming on the channel. I, I really enjoyed this discussion, and I hope my audience are you going to, it. Are you going to are you going to tell us who won this now, Joe? <laughs> of course, of course. I think uh, I think the audience won. I think that's who won. So uh, 
So yeah, um, yeah. Thank you guys again for coming on, and uh, shout out to both of your work because in the in the description I've linked your film people stuff, your websites if you have them and whatnot. I will find all that online and put that down in there. So for the audience, you guys can check that out. Again, check out the paper that we've been talking about, which is published in IJPR. It's called "God and Gratuitous Evil: Between the Rock and the Hard Place." And of course, if you guys in the audience have made it this far, you probably see value in the work that I do. So please smash that like button. It's totally free. Turn on that little bell for notifications and subscribe to the channel. And of course, if you really see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting me on Patreon or through one-time donation. Links to those are in the description. And of course, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is the Majesty of Reason, and peace out. <laughs>